Okay, what we have here is two adventures that I mashed into one. The Room with Five Corners and a Claret Wellspring. Both of these adventures are from the prepared book from Cobalt Press. This is one of their earlier publications from 2016. And these earlier publications are not quite as fleshed out as some of their later publications, but the foundation of a story is there. The primary concept that I have for my adventure with these two little one-shots that I mashed together is that uh, the, the party is going to deal with the idea of, of weakness from a curse. Now, there's no big bad evil guy. There's no main evil presence that they can define. The evil presence is, is some sort of eldritch horror, some sort of primordial... Uh, existence, some some rule that predates even the Faerunian gods. And they're going to encounter this, and then they're going to get cursed. And the entire story is about how do they deal with this curse, and how far are they willing to go to try to break themselves out of this curse. So that's their, their main motivation, as opposed to trying to destroy some evil guy, or trying to get rich, or anything like that. Now, The Room with Five Corners, this adventure is about, uh, it's pretty much just one short one shot with two encounters. And what it's about is that the, uh, the party is given a task to, uh, to go and investigate cult activity. Now, there used to be a street gang called the Untamed, and there was a change in the leadership of the street gang. And these members, these pickpockets, uh, who are members of the Untamed, began to see a transformation. They began to become ethereal. They stopped casting shadows. And the authorities in the big city are worried that they are participating in cult activity. And they commission the party to go and investigate this. Now, when after the party investigates this, they're going to encounter some sort of eldritch horror that curses them. This curse is going to persist on the characters. They're not going to be able to remove the curse unless they go further down the rabbit hole and they travel to a faraway land where they come upon the Claret Wellspring. Now, the premise of the Claret Wellspring is that sometime in the far distant past, Prior to even the formation of gods, prior to even Mistra uh, taking over the weave of magic, there was the there were these elemental primeval forces, and at some point the very first spell was cast. Uh, that was the the origin of of organized magic, as opposed to just elemental forces. When that first spell was cast. Uh, it appears that the, the spell that was first cast has not completed its casting. So there's, there exists some sort of nidus of primal, uh, primal energy. And uh, this is pretty much the adventure for the Claret Wellspring. Now, all of this is actually very, very vague, and I want it to remain that way. I don't want to... Because the idea is that I want to take people out of the zone of, of knowledge. They go into this realm where they don't understand quite exactly what they're facing. They don't understand the primeval forces. Even if they're very accomplished, knowledgeable wizards with high intelligence and very high skill checks, there's no skill check that's going to tell them what exactly they're dealing with, which is a deviation from what I like, normally like to do. Is um, I normally like to have a very thorough explanation of the evil forces that the players face, whether it's an evil bad guy or some sort of evil magic or some, some catastrophic event. What has happened to the characters here is very vague, but from behind the scenes, what has happened is that there is this primal force, um, in, uh, primal force in the universe uh, of Faerun, and this primal force supersedes even the control that the gods have over the weave and, and over the realms. And something about this primal force, the first spell that has ever been cast, uh, the nidus of that first spell still exists. So the first spell that has ever been cast is still active. And this is something that the, the gods either don't want to or can't do anything about. Now, because that power still exists in some primeval um, zone, there are darker forces, sort of like Far Realm, Cthulhu-like forces, uh, 
like outer realm forces that have usurped this power and taken it for them for themselves. Uh, in doing so, they have corrupted the original nidus of the pro of this primal spellcasting. Now, this still this sounds very vague, but the idea is that there was some sort of ancient power, and the ancient power was corrupted by evil things. And that's all the players really have to know about this, because when the players try to investigate it, they're not going to have the knowledge, and and it's purposely vague, because. What I want to play with is the mechanic of a curse. Now, in 5th edition, a curse is nothing because there is a spell called Remove Curse. And when we take a look at it, right here, all curses affecting one creature or an object end. If the object is a magic item, the curse remains, but the spell breaks its owner's attunement to the object. So the problem is that when you describe a spell like this, this is like a like a like a get out of jail free, a curse cannot be dangerous to you kind of spell. You know, it's sort of like the paladin's um, um, immunity from disease. It just completely removes the mechanic from the game. As long as you can cast the spell, or you can go to some sort of holy temple and get the spell cast on you, the curses are no longer a mechanic in the game. I, I think it's awful. You know, because I like to play with the idea of curses because the curse itself is the driving motivator for the, for the player characters. What they're trying, when they, once they get cursed, the curse is going to be real bad. And it's going to be so bad that their only motivation is to try to remove this curse. And that's what this uh, adventure is about. So what I have to do is I have to create a system, a mechanic, a force that supersedes even the magic in this remove curse spell. So even though the remove curse spell says all curses affecting one creature and um, this is a power that is beyond this spell. So that's how I justify being able to curse players. Otherwise, if we play regular fifth edition rules, curses don't mean crap, right? Curses and diseases, they don't mean anything because these spells can easily get rid of them, like lesser restoration, remove disease, remove curse, just gets rid of these things. So what we want is something that persists and the players cannot get rid of this curse unless they pursue uh, they, they, they pursue the special requirement to go and cleanse this, uh, this primordial uh, nidus that has been corrupted. So the players are going to start off in the uh, I placed this in the city of Baldur's Gate. And Baldur's Gate is a stratified society. It's got an upper city, a lower, sit, a lower city, and like an outer city. The upper city is where the rich people live. The lower city, or um, the lower city, is where kind of the uh, middle class and poor people live. And the outer city is where the vagabonds live. So the party is going to start in the outer city because. Uh, in the recent history of Baldur's Gate, there was the murder at Baldur's Gate, and that's sent the city into a political turmoil. People are really scared of this idea of the god of murder, Baal, coming back. You know, after the canon Baldur's Gate hero, Abdel Adrian, was slain, he was the last, uh, he was said to be the last Baal spawn. Once all the Baal spawn are slain, Baal's essence has coalesced, and he is returning to the realms. So people are terrified of the idea of a Bale cult reforming in Baldur's Gate. And that's the premise. So there's going to be a man. Uh, this is going to be the quest giver. Here we go. I've made this guy. His name is going to be Sir Dane. And he is a one of the head uh, sergeants in the Flaming Fist, which is a mercenary group inside Baldur's Gate. And he is going to catch wind of this problem of, of cult activity, the unnamed, which is normally a small group of pickpockets in Baldur's Gate. Now they have, um, they're, they're, they have been kind of uh, messing around with a cult activity and he is afraid that they are a, um, an emerging cult of bail now because of the political turmoil in baldur's gate this is a very sensitive issue he cannot have it known by anyone that there's a cult of bail because the flaming fist 
has uh, promised that they will em eliminate these dark uh, cults to the dark gods. And if a cult does exist, it means that they're they're not doing very well. They're failing in their task, and that would might learn uh, that might lead to a really bad political consequence. For instance, they are uh, they are com um, they are in support of the current Duke of Baldur's Gate, Torin Silvershield, and that would weaken the Duke's position. Right now, it's a very tentative position. Uh, people are vying for control. So, because of the politics, uh, the flaming fist does not want to come out and openly admit that there may be a cult of Baal operating. So that's the premise of hiring the party. It's going to be very secretive. The party's going to show up. Uh, they're, they're going to catch wind of some, some, you know, some, some mysterious figure who's offering like 2,000 gold to do a very desperate quest. They're going to be in a desperate part of the city and they're go and whoever, you know, goes uh, whoever takes on this kind of quest, they're usually very desperate and very dangerous. But the party is going to start off very destitute. I'm not going to start them off with any magical items. They're going to have a minimal amount of starting gold. So, they're looking to uh, take on any quest they can because the times have been really tough. They're actually losing money. The last couple of quests that the party has taken has turned out to be a bust. So they need a real kind of win in, in terms of taking on an adventuring quest. They need to make some money. So the party is going to, I'm going to make it very clear to them that they're going to be very desperate. And because they're so desperate, they're going to go to Sir Dane and they're likely going to accept whatever terms he has. He's going to say, well, I'm not really sure that this cult is a cult of Baal. But I need you to eliminate this cult and I need you to be discreet. So he gives them instructions specifically on how to find these pickpockets called a street gang called the Unnamed. And he's going to lead them to the docks district and a party's going to come here down this alleyway. Now, the, uh, the initial encounter they're going to have is going to be very easy. So these encounters are going to get incrementally more difficult. This the this is the, the idea is I'm built you gotta I'm trying to build some atmosphere so the party kind of first they show up they're very confident they're gonna be able to take out these uh, bad guys very easily here let me there's a scout over here a couple of scouts over here and then there's a guy called a gladiator I'm probably gonna you know name him something else but he's a little bit stronger he's challenge rating five with 112 hit points so these guys are challenge rating one half with 16 hit points so they're more like minions if you think of fourth edition minions they go down in one or two hits it just gives the impression that there's a lot more uh, characters but i don't want the party to exhaust their resources because they got a tougher fight later on so they're gonna they're gonna come in and they're going to kind of you know depends on how they approach this um if they kind of incite the attack then ev uh, then everybody from up here is going to come down here and they're going to have a little uh, fight over here and they're going um the people here are going to warn the cultists uh back in a room over here but if the party uses their intelligence they start talking to the uh, cultists they kind of they kind of lie their way through this i might even allow them to skip this specific encounter so eventually the party gets past these guys and they come to this uh, this door now this door is going to be sealed with a pentagram it's going to be like a pentagram in blood so i'm introducing the party immediately to the idea that they're kind of walking into the realm of the occult but there's nothing here specific to bail so the party is coming here expecting well this is going to be a cult to bail and they're gonna they're gonna quickly realize that these although these unnamed pickpockets are cultists uh, what they're worshiping are outsiders, you know, um, far realm creatures uh, like Cthulhu, old one kind of creatures. You know, the kind of pa uh, patrons warlocks have, uh, the unnamed. They're not associated with any specific deity. So the party is going to get inside this room. Uh, let me let me put down a token. Party's gonna come inside this room and they're gonna notice right away that there's something otherworldly going on. There's gonna be um, multicolored lights 
However, for some reason, the very color of of your uh, uh, of of the characters and the col- uh, colors that are supposed to be there are black and white, even though there's these multicolored swirling lights all over the place. And you know, if they try to do some sort of magical um, investigation, they're going to realize that this is chaos, wild magic. You know, this is not any form of organized magic, and they've kind of left the realm of normality. So the parties, this is an empty room. They're going to explore this room, and then they're going to get to this magically sealed door here. Now, the minute they open the door, they're going to encounter all the all the people having a cult ritual behind it. But this, uh, so here is the crux of the adventure. In order to open this door, the party is going to get cursed. Now, what's really going on is that the people behind this door, there is a uh, there's a man is um. Well, right now he's not named, but his name's going to be Jurgis. And Jurgis is, uh, he was previously a a leader of the Untamed, one of these pickpocket street gangs. But he was also like a necromancer. He was a wizard. He liked to practice the dark arts. He made contact with some sort of otherworldly being from the far realm. This being's name is Zilrock. Zilrock. And he's a, actually a gibbering mouther. And uh, Yorgis uh, made a deal with a gibbering mouther. He's uh, he will feed souls to the gibbering mouther. We, uh, you know, this far re- realm being is hungry for living souls. Uh, he will conduct a ritual to open a door to the and and allow these far realm creatures to pour through the door. Uh, so he can feed souls to the gibbering mouther. In return, the gibbering mouther promises him incredible arcane magic because the uh, incredible primeval uh, primeval magic, because it is this gibbering mouther that has corrupted that original ni- uh, nidus where the first spell was cast, and he has harnessed some sort of, some form of um, pre arcane pre weave magic. Uh, and he has promised it to Yurgis. So Yurgis is um, Yurgis's end of the deal is that he has to bring in souls, and the uh, the best way to bring in some uh, the souls is these symbol curses. So on the door leading into the room, there is a swirling mass of symbols. Now, when the players interact with it, um, the three unlucky players that are the first three to interact with this door, they're going to get the symbol curses. So the players aren't going to really know it. I'm going to describe the door as this swirling um, magical barrier uh, surrounding the door. And the players, of course, naturally, they're going to say, well, I'm going to go up to the door and I'm going to try to investigate it using Arcana. That's what they would, or, or I'm going to um, see the door is trapped. Well, the minute you walk up to the door and you stare at this swirling mass of images, one of the, you're going to get cursed with one of the images. They're going to coalesce, and um, you're going to get affected with it. The three images he, uh, that I have, and depending on which uh, who goes there first, I think the first person that uh, that messes with this door is going to get the image of madness and i wrote sendom which is just madness backwards i'm hoping the players will pick up on that but they may not initially they may just kind of look at it and they don't know what to make of it so this image is gonna gonna coalesce and the first player gets the symbol sendom uh he's not going to be able to open the door but messing with the door is going to weaken the barrier and then the second player that comes up to the barrier is going to be cursed with anguish this is anguish spelled backwards, which is Hisunga, right? The symbol looks like this. And the third player is going to get symbol fear, which is rife, which is fear spelled backwards. Now, they're not going to immediately start getting the effects of the curses. So they might even forget about it, which is what I want. Because in order to open this door, they have to go in, they have to expose themselves to symbols. And I don't want them to know right away how bad it is once you get exposed to symbols. So once three players interact with the door, and that's exactly what Jurgis had in mind. Because Jurgis knows that in order to, uh, in order to, 
uh, to feed these souls to the gibbering mouth they're named as Yilrock. Uh, they have to they have to go under these far realm curses. The far realm curses surpass uh, the ability for uh, magical remove curses. So he puts that on on purpose, and the entire ritual, the purpose of the ritual, is to feed these players' souls to the gibbering mouther. Uh, he knows that the players are, are coming in, and they're going to try to mess with this because it has been foretold to him by the gibbering mouther. Uh, he has a way of communicating with them. So the minute the players open this, it's going to be, it's going to be. Uh, well, I. They could try to talk to Jurgis, and if they do, I'm going to have... You know what? I need to have another one of these um, warriors, like these gladiator people in here, uh, to, for, for the fight. But because the, the fight consists of the Gibbering Mouth, there are two Grells, a bunch of these scouts, which go down in one hit, and Jurgis. I think that, you know, I, I need at least something else, you know, to, to make the fight a little bit more juicy. Because if the characters come in and they try to talk to Jurgis, they say, what's going on? I demand to know what's going on. I don't know why they would, because there's going to be these horrible monsters hanging out. Uh, the, uh, Jurgis is going to try to keep them there for as long as possible. If he can keep them there for like a minute or two, then the curses take effect. And fighting this battle with the curses is going to be deadly. Fighting the battle without the curses is going to be probably a modest challenge. So that's the idea. Jurgis is... Jurgis is um, trying to stall them when they come in he's gonna start talking to them he's gonna you know he might even pretend to like say oh you know what I, what i'm doing is wrong i'm just going to you know maybe i should uh, close this portal so when they walk into the room the the idea is you're leaving the realm of sanity so the description of the room the the, the view through the doorway into the back room portrays a dizzying spectacle of nightmare beyond the threshold is a plain chamber reach along one wall by a geometric geometric impossibility. This is what drew me to this module to begin with. A fifth corner has appeared, and yet the shape of the room remains square. So I actually lit this up too. Where, where's my light? There we go. This corner over here is partially in the far realm. This their portal has been opened up by Jurgis, and this this whole situation has has kind of gone um, gone into the realm of utter madness. So the party, I mean, I don't know what they're going to do. They may immediately start fighting, or they may try to make sense of this. And the more they try to make sense of this, the more Jurgis stalls them. Uh, after a, a minute or so, the curse is going to begin taking effect. If the party begins fighting without talking to Jurgis and they just start attacking, uh, you know, they can get through this encounter without suffering the curses. So, um, fighting, uh, the, first of all, fighting the Grell, the Grell is pretty tough. So, the party needs to identify who's dangerous and who's not. These little scouts, they're nothing. They go down with two hits. You don't, you know, you can, you can. You can probably cast a shatter or something, kill all of them. But these Grells, uh, they have these tentacles. And if they hit you with a tentacle, uh, you get restrained. You get grappled, you get restrained, and you get poisoned. And you get paralyzed. So... If these if these two growls if they can grab two party members um they, they you know this might be a TPK right here so the party needs to identify them as threats and they need to they, they need to know that this gibbering mouth their name Zerl talk how do I pronounce his name X L R I E H comma O C Zrelok uh, the gibbering mouth there can be real bad because um, he uh, it has sort of an aura. Now, the way I like to play it, I don't like to play the aura where you end your turn there and then you, you have to get under the effect of gibbering because people catch uh, players catch on to that real quick and they don't end their turn uh, in a space. So what I do is at the beginning of every turn, I apply the, uh, I apply the aura effect and I roll saves uh, as long as the players are within the 20 feet, uh, 20 feet of the gibbering mouther. And uh, if they if they fail their save on the gibbering mouther, it sucks uh, because uh, they become incapacitated, 
and they have to roll dice to see what they do. They enter this state of madness. You know, on a one to four, the creature does nothing. On a five to six, the creature takes no action or bonus action and can only use his movement uh, to move randomly. On a seven or eight, the patient makes an attack at a random creature. You know, so these, the, you know, if they get under the influence of the gibbering, they start hearing these, you know, this gibber, gibbering mouth there is this globulous um, entity with um, mouths and tentacles. And the mouths are constantly whispering and gibbering and say, uh, talking nonsense. So if they don't, if they don't get uh, under the spell now, this is, it's not so bad because it's a DC 10 wisdom saving throw. So by and large, the party will succeed. Uh, however, um, I don't even think there's a repeat save. Yeah, this is something that happens every turn. So it's pretty bad because once you get under the effect, it's, uh, um, you have to reroll it next turn. Uh, Gibbering Mouther also has like some, some difficult terrain around it. Uh, well, it's not really difficult terrain, but it's a, it's a strength saving throw or have a speed reduced to 10. So it's hard if you're near the gibbering mouth to get away from it. And then on top of that, it's got a recharge for blinding. Um, instead of blinding, I like to have this do damage. Uh, the the spittle, uh, because it spits in a line. Because uh, uh, doing, um, you know, just just uh, blinding, uh, just, uh, just a blinding effect. I mean, it's kind of bad. But, you know, it's it's more like, well, if, 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 if you're spitting a huge thing, if you're spitting a big line, um, it's it kind of uh, harkens back to more like a like a like a dragon breath. Uh, and plus, he already has something that incapacitates players, so I don't want two things that are incapacitating players because now they're blind and they're insane. So I'd rather have the blinding spittle. It's a recharge. I'd rather have it do damage. I have it do the same amount of damage as the bite attack, and it's a DC 13 dex save to do, uh, take up half damage. So the gibbering mouth there is quite a handful, as is. Um, the important thing about this battle is that the party needs to identify that that's uh, the gibbering mouther and these two grells. That's the dangerous. The Yurgis the priest does have some cleric spells, but he's certainly not the dangerous uh, enemy here. You know, he's got spirit guardians is the worst that he can do, which is not a big deal. And plus, I don't think he has that many hit points. Yeah, he's got 27 hit points. So um, they they need to recognize instead of focusing on, you know, they all focus on Yurgis and, and kill Yurgis and other people. Then they got to fight these three creatures. And that's going to that in itself is going to be a difficult battle. Plus, I need to have I think I need to have another one of those gladiators here just to kind of tank for these guys, because none of these guys can tank that well. So eventually the party is going to be able to take this uh, this encounter down. It's going to be like a modest encounter. I don't think it's going to be a deadly encounter unless the party's already cursed when they fight them. The minute they um, finish this encounter, that's when these curses take effect. And that's where the story begins. So whoever is cursed with madness um when they're in combat they're gonna suffer from madness they're gonna see friends as foes and uh enemies as friends and they're gonna be compelled to attack their friends uh, i will allow some ins uh you know maybe like an insight check or two uh for them to withhold from attacking but they're gonna be pretty much worthless in combat and in on a role-playing perspective every creature they see is gonna look like a demon they're gonna go insane but at the same time uh, the gibbering mouther, the way he he kind of enticed Yurgis to make the promises, he's gonna give Yurgis whatever Yurgis desires. So I'm gonna ask the player, what what is your greatest desire? At first, the player's not gonna be totally sure that this curse is so bad. So it depends on what the players say. The players say, I want gold. I'm gonna give them gold, but I'm gonna do so in sort of like a monkey paw fashion, sort of like when 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 the players cast wish and they ask for something ridiculous. There's gonna be some sort of catch to it. So the players are gonna be like, "Yeah, I want uh, gold and treasure," and then all of a sudden the player is gonna find a lot of gold and treasure, but it may belong to a nobleman with a lot of guards, you know, something like that. But, but at first it's going to be like that, but at the same time, they're also going to come under the effect of the madness. 
you know, they're going to start seeing things. They're going to start going a little bit loony. Uh, that's not enough, however. Uh, I need this to really, really hurt. So what I'm going to do in addition to this is the curse will also give you an ability drain. Uh, players are going to roll d6 down the line. And whichever number they roll, that ability is going to be drained six points. So it's going to be nasty. The players are going to be badly gimped with these curses. Now, madness is a bad curse, uh, but anguish is going to be even worse. This curse, uh, what I have planned for the, uh, the unfortunate fool who gets the anguish symbol, is that uh, this person is going to suffer constant damage. Every 10 minutes, this player takes 2d8 psychic damage. He takes this damage until he hits one pit point and he stays at one hit point. So he, he may try to heal himself, which he can. And then, you know, his hit points go down, up, but then after 10 minutes, he takes another uh, ten, uh, 10 points of damage. He, his skin is gonna be full of boils. Um, he is going to start uh, crumbling. He's gonna be in extreme pain all the time. Uh, if he takes a long rest, he's gonna drop down to one hit point because this, symbol is going to constantly cause him pain so in combat he's going to be a player character who has one hit point you know they have to be smart enough to heal him up before the combat because this recycles every 10 minutes uh the last one symbol fear is exactly what it sounds like this player is going to be terrified he's going to be afraid of everything um, he's going to be afraid of everything that he sees, and in combat, he's going to be under the fear effect, meaning that he can't approach his object of fear, which is whatever is going to be hostile in combat. Um, and he has disadvantage on all his attacks. So with these curses, you take a level 6 party and you gimp them down. They are about as effective as a level 3 party you know if they don't unless they find a way around it so that's the secret to this adventure is that they have to find a way to deal with the fact that these uh, these rule breaking curses are destroying them so the party naturally once they get cursed there's going to be some loot here i think i'm going to give them some magic items some magic scrolls and a lot of gold and they're going to be able to loot the bodies uh once they clean up here they're going to help dispose of the bodies and follow their contract which means it has to be discreet none of these bodies can be lying on a the street they're going to go and try to get themselves healed naturally they're going to go to the temple of the thander uh to see if they can get healed they're going to get the remove curse spell cast on them so th here's the rub the remove curse spell will eliminate the curse that's placed on them but the curse comes back an hour later and when they start inquiring about what kind of disease they have they run some skill checks they they seek some healing they're going to be told that they they have spell plague which is um you know there's absolutely no cure to spell plague uh, the only thing that you can do if you get spell plague is try to try to die a peaceful death go to asylum or have somebody end your miserable existence so things are going to be really really bleak however uh this is where i think the adventure actually begins because this is more just a setup for the adventure uh once they defeat yurgis they're going to find on yurgis's person a very expensive navigation tool it's going to be a diamond encrusted navigation tool and what this tool is is it's a sextant uh for sailors uh, used to navigate and i think the party is going to kind of inquire around town they're going to talk to sailors they're going to talk to wizards and intellectuals i'm going to kind of make it make it a little bit of a cha uh, of a conquest uh, i mean not a conquest um a little bit of an adventure in itself for them to discover how the what they can do with the sextant because that's going to be the key to trying to find a way to cure their disease in the end, they're going to discover that the way they cure their disease is that they have to go to the Claret Wellspring. The Claret Wellspring is going to be an unnamed island located in the sea of track uh, in the trackless sea. It's going to be like way past beyond Moonshine Isles. It's going to be in the middle of nowhere, and the only way to get there is a skilled sailor is going to have to be able to use this navigation tool interpret properly so i'm going to leave that up to role playing i'm going to see how the characters approach it 
uh, who they talk to. You know, I'll probably, you know, if, if they kind of get stuck, I'll probably have them, you know, they're going to find somebody. However, it's going to cost them a lot of gold because remember, they're, they're making over 2000 gold to, to do this quest. So they're going to have enough gold to pay for it, but they may have to just pay, pay all the gold that they just made just to go and cure, uh, cure themselves of the curse that they, they've been inflicted. And, um, yeah, but that's the whole point of this adventure is that they came, they, they started the adventure thinking that they're just coming, coming in and killing this cult. And then they get, um, afflicted with this horrible curse. So regardless, they're going to find some sort of sailor. They're going to commission a ship. And most ships would not be willing to go out into the middle of nowhere. So they're going to have to be very convincing. They'll commission a ship that's going to take them past the Moonshine Isles. And then uh, an experienced sailor is going to be able to use the navigation tool. The navigation tool is going to take them into the mists. The, uh, in the ocean, there's these high waves. And then there's these routes that no ships actually take. You know, the ships normally take these uh, routes that follow along so they don't have storm. They don't face that many storms. This is going to be um, an obscure route into the middle of the ocean and then as they go there they're gonna um they're gonna see a huge thick fog and the ship is gonna fail sail into the fog uh regardless of what happens the ship is gonna crash because the fog is so thick that the sailor and the party's gonna have to convince whoever the sailor is or the captain is to sail into this fog but if they do so they're not going to be able to see the island that they crash into so the party is going to come upon this island called, uh, and uh, and this is going to start the adventure called the Claret Wellspring. The island is mostly dead, not much vegetation. Uh, the party is going to see a bunch of obelisks on the island, and the obelisks is going uh, they're going to have clues about this. So I don't, you know, even though what the part, you know, what is behind the story in this adventure meaning this primordial magic this unexplained primordial magic has been corrupted and that's what's cursing the party that's not explicitly told to the party but these obelisks are going to have ancient netherese and they're going to give like some clues like um, one of the clues is going to be like um, the very first spell that has ever been cast will be cast here you know something like that so the party can can have some sort of idea of what they're dealing with i want it to be vague but i you know i want it to i don't want to make it look like i didn't even work on this <laughs> like that big so the party's going to get some vague idea but they're going to un uh, come to understand that they need to get to the center of this island because one of the things described in the Claret Wellspring is that there are the you know the Claret Wellspring uh, je, uh, the the way the adventure is described is that it's in the middle of the desert uh, on an oasis in a pool filled with blood and that's what you see here on this map but what it really what I have it in my adventure is that it's going to be the center of the island in the pool full of, uh, full of blood. And there's these shock waves that come out of it. These are waves of wild magic that come out of here because of the corrupted first spell. And uh, any any character that has arcane knowledge is going to be able to decipher that these are waves of wild magic and they're coming from the center of the island. So it's eventually it's going to gear the party to get to the center of the island where they encounter this huge pool of blood. A uh, pool of blood is going to be difficult terrain. It's weightable blood kind of comes up to your knees. And what this what this pool of blood is, is um, it's uh, it, it's a pool, but it's got couple of drains and it's got a sundial right here so when the party comes the way to get rid of the blood uh what they have to do is get uh, drain the blood because once they drain the blood underneath the sundial is a hatch that brings them to this little secret chamber and in order to drain the blood they have to turn the sundial because once they turn the sundial uh these little um little holes beneath this pool of blood open up and the blood starts to drain and uh pretty much what i have in store is um big combat encounter now if they uh once they initiate this they're going to fight this it's it's a blood elemental made out of this pool of blood this represents the corruption of this primordial magic 
that um, that has created these curses that afflict the party members, and um, this is what Yurgis, um, you know, the, the the forces that Yurgis has made a deal with. The party needs to defeat this, even though it's labeled blood elemental. It's just a reskinned water elemental, uh, which should not be a hard battle. Let me see. So water elemental challenge rating five, you know, even though the party is very badly gimped because they have one player who has one hit point, unless they're smart enough to heal that player up prior to combat, he's going to go into combat with one hit point. We got another player who's under a constant fear effect, and we got a third player who's mad and probably is not going to be able to do anything in combat. But even with that, a water elemental is is beatable. You know, it's got a got a full 114 hit points. Um, he's got that well uh, that whelm thing, and I think I'm gonna extend this little whelm ability to to affect the entire pool. So uh, everybody in the pool must make that DC 10, uh, 15 strength saving throw, or take the bludgeoning damage, uh, and also will get grappled around in the pool. Uh, and it's, a, it's also a four to six recharge. I might I might change this around a little bit. So this is going to be a fairly tough encounter, depending on how badly the party is gimped by their curses. Uh, this is the challenge of this adventure. If the party is smart enough to work around their curses, or if they're lucky enough, where let's say that party with one hit point is the ranged, um, you know, archer or the ranged wizard, uh, the one hit point is not that bad because he's that party members keeping his distance anyway um it wouldn't be as bad um or if that that feared party member is a wizard and um you know he's not attacking he's just uh, inducing saves in the enemy uh the fear effect is not as bad it's just he can't approach it um that they, if they're lucky they can the, the fight won't be that hard or if they find ways to overcome it now remember the remove curse spell can be cast on the party member to suppress the curse for one hour so if the party figures that out and they're able to cast remove curse they can they can start this combat with a curse suppressed and they can fight more normally that would also uh, offer them a big advantage so this is what i want the players to think of and how they want to strategize to to beat this encounter it'll make the encounter a lot easier if they fight it straight up i think they still have a great chance of winning it's just going to be a much tougher encounter so once they destroy the water elemental the uh, the blood in the pool is going to completely drain once that happens, they're gonna. It's going to be like, oh, you've destroyed my weaker form. Now you shall fight my true form, and the dragon's gonna come out. Uh, this dragon's gonna be named Sheathal. Unfortunately, the dragon and the party is not gonna know this, but this dragon is is um, a manifestation, a projection of the entity that cast the very first spell. I'm going to leave it vague. It's, uh, we don't know if this is a person, this is some sort of, you know, like primordial human, uh, this is um, some dead god. Um, the Zethal is not going to know what it once was, but it does know that it was the first creature that cast, uh, the first creature that cast any spell across the realms, thus creating, um, thus consolidating magic in itself. This happened even before Mistra control the weave of magic so this creature is very very old however it's become a dragon because it's been corrupt it's been corrupted by these four far realm forces when the party when zathal emerges it's going to be a dragon emerging out of the out of um the blood it's going to be a dragon composed of flesh and blood a really disgusting looking creature um it's actually not going to immediately fight the party it's going to be thankful because the party destroying that first form of the dragon, the water elemental, has given this creature clarity. Now this creature um, remembers that it was once an entity here to protect this realm. Uh, the creature is going to, the party is going to, uh, going to. I'm hoping they're not going to just immediately start attacking, but they're going to start parlaying with the with Zithal, the dragon. And they're going to ask, naturally, they're going to ask Zethal, can, can you cure, you know, what can we do about these curses? Zethal's going to tell them that under this hatch, 
it leads to a chamber, and this chamber、uh, was the chamber where the first spell was cast when Zethal was in his original form. At this point, Zethal doesn't even remember what his form is. All he knows is he has to protect that chamber. Zethal is thankful that the party has destroyed most of the corrupting influence, but they have not been able to destroy all of the corrupting influence. Zethal says there's enough power. Um, enough primordial energy inside this chamber to cure one of them. So, there, so this is、um, this is my little、uh, twist for the party. The party has a choice. First choice is that they cure one of their party members. The other two party members remain cursed. However, Zethal is going to give hints. There, he's going to say there are other Claret Well Springs. Uh, and yet, you must find across the lands, and that'll leave a big question mark for future adventures. I'm not going to pursue that any further, and the game will have to end there with this big question of the party going on and pursuing、uh, further further adventures to cure themselves. That's one option. The second option is Zethal says, if you can destroy me and destroy me entirely. Then my very soul and my essence will be enough to cure all three of you. And he's going to give them the challenge. They ha- they have to kill this dragon. And、um, from my experience, whenever I give players this kind of a choice, they almost always t-、uh, do that final battle. But、um, I I do you know I I want to I want them to feel like. They chose to undergo this battle. I don't want to feel like I railroaded them into the battle. I just happen to know. Just I know how people think, how players think, and this is how I would think too. I wouldn't skip this battle. It's all. It looks like an awesome battle. So, the players I think are going to choose to fight the dragon, and this、uh, fighting the dragon is going to be a deadly encounter. So this dragon is a reskinned、uh, topaz dragon. Uh, it's going to be a, a blood dragon. A topaz dragon is I,、uh, another dragon that I took from the Cobalt Press, and it's,、uh, it's his challenge rating seven. I'm going to I need to bump up these hit points. One twenty seven is not enough. The party might take him down too quick, so I need to I need to bump that up. But this dragon has an innate,、uh, no material components cast of bane or create or destroy water, and.、Uh, The dragon, the so the way I judge dragons and when I have dragon fights, is I, I I first ask the question: Can this dragon's breath one shot the party? If the dragon's breath can one shot the party, then you know you probably have a challenge that's a little bit too tough. The dragon's breath is supposed to devastate the party, but if the party cannot do any, you know, can't even survive the initial dragon's breath, then you might be dealing with.、Um, Um, you might be dealing with too much of, of a TPK situation. You want it to be deadly, but you don't want、uh, instant destruction. So this dragon does 86 necrotic. The average of 86 given here is 28. So a bunch of、um, so let's say 28 is the median. Now the more dice you roll, the closer the result is going to be in the median. That's just statistics. So if you're rolling six dice, it's gonna be fairly close to twenty-eight to thirty. Now, can this party take thirty points of damage? Well, the party just came from a water elemental fight, so I think that Zethal is going to actually give the party. You know, since this is an organized fight, I don't see why Zethal would not just say, "Okay, you wish to destroy me and release my energy. I will allow you to go ahead and sleep." So the party can take a long rest and come in full strength, except for that poor fool who has one hit point. I hope I really hope that they're smart enough to heal this guy up before the battle, and they realize that, you know, he he he's taking damage every ten minutes, not every turn or anything like that. But assuming that everybody is back up to full health, they can easily take thirty points of damage. That's a、uh, that's assuming they fail their save and we get the average amount of damage of eight d six. So let's just for just just for sake of argument, we'll roll the eight d six. Oops, let me take the dice away here. Roll the eight d six. We got twenty one, twenty nine, twenty nine, 
You see, when you roll that many dice, more likely than not, you're going to be hanging around the average. You're not going to be on the upper echelon. You're not going to be near 48, which is the maximum. You're going to be kind of kind of coasting around the average. Um, the party can easily take 30 points of damage at level 6. Easy. And, uh, the, uh, and that's if they don't even, if they fail their save. This is a, a DC 13 constitution saving throw, which isn't, you know, it's modestly hard, but it's not that difficult. So the initial breath weapon is not going to destroy the party, meaning that this dragon's very fightable. But uh, once the dragon blows his br uh, breath, um, the first thing you do when you're playing a dragon is you, you gotta, the, you know, as early as possible, get as many players in your breath as possible, discharge the breath. That's, that's paramount to running a dragon. Once he does that, he flies. He's gonna fly around. He's gonna land, attack the party, land, attack the party. As a matter of fact, this dragon is, I think, is too weak for the party. Um, I need to beef this dragon up. I need to give him more hit points. And I need to give this dragon legendary actions. Uh, I need um, I need the dragon to have more action economy. So in between uh, the dragon's turns, I will give him three legendary actions where he can do extra bites or claws, or he can have movements. I don't want to give this dragon legendary resistance. He already has pretty devastating saves. So I don't want to add on top of that, you know, if the party rolls lucky and they get him with a whole monster or something, just let him have it. That's fine. Uh, but um, I don't want to give him layer actions either because they're level six parties. So legendary actions, I think, will make this combat well balanced into the deadly range. So there's a good chance that he will kill the party because um, the dragon flight's going to make the biggest difference. If the party does not have a lot of ranged this dragon is going to fly over to the wizard, kill the wizard, and then stay in the air, fly around until his breath recharges, come down, breath, fly back up. Um, the, you know, if I want to cheese the players like that and I want to make the battle really tough and I'm really determined to kill them, the dragon will do that. Um, but I don't think I'll make it that bad. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll have the dragon land sometimes so the party can get a couple of hits off and then have them take off. So assuming that the party is able to take this dragon out they're going to go into the claret wellspring now they do have an encounter in the claret wellspring itself they have this mamora creature he's got a claw attack and he's got a whip tail stinger but what i'm thinking is that you know this is not a very interesting encounter especially after fighting a dragon this will be kind of um kind of ho-hum to fight this creature. I think this creature will just be a shepherd uh, into into the wells. He's going to teach the party. So the, what the what this vault uh, itself is called, it's called the Soundless Vault. It's a cramped triangular chamber, as described, supported by two dark stone columns in its center. Sound is strangely muted, and voices only carry a few feet. So this is supposed to be alien, otherworldly space because this is where the first spell was cast. And this altar, this ritual alcove number three over here, is what the party has to step into to cleanse their own curses. So I think when the par if the party reach reach this point, they they probably either they took the dragon's deal or they defeat the dragon. I think I'll just skip this encounter, and the party's going to come in and heal themselves, and that will end the adventure. So, um, the, the underlying idea of this adventure is not a big bad evil guy, not a complex story. It's, um, it's a pretty straightforward narrative. Um, the main concept of this, this adventure is a party dealing with a severe weakness, a curse on three pl uh, players in the party, and how they get around that. You know, it's, it's a more of a mechanical challenge because knowing players and knowing how I play the game, if you tell me all of a sudden my strength is minus six, you know, that is going to be my very, my, my one and only priority in playing the game. And then, you know, for me to get rid of that horrible effect. And that's going to be, that's going to be the motivation of the players. So I think that there's satisfaction if you, if you have a strength of negative six and you're able to accomplish a goal and take away that curse, I think that satisfaction is there. 
that's you know that's a different kind of satisfaction than destroying some horrible evil villain or getting that magical loot but it's it, you know it's still i think equally satisfying and that's the you know that's the thesis of this adventure now the one last note i want to make about this adventure is that i want i am including the cobalt press playtest so i'll bring this up Now, the Cobalt Press playtest here, this is packet one of the Cobalt pl Press playtest, and I, I really want to, you know, um, I, w I want to try these things out because I'm also looking at the 1D&D 5.5 playtest, and I'm really disappointed. I'm not liking what I, ha uh, what I see in that playtest. First and foremost, um, they are making changes that increase player options right for for instance they're disassociating ability scores with races which i'm neutral to instead they're lumping ability scores onto backgrounds they're may um they're giving you more options so you you know just playing a dwarf won't necessarily give you a constitution boost you know things like that that that's what they're trying to do they're trying to get players to play whatever the race they want be whatever you want there's no restrictions that's the idea um, but they're also putting in things that I absolutely despise. This Ardling race, garbage, complete garbage. Like, uh, you know, it's, it's a, it's a race that's catering to people who like, like little furries and stuffed animals, which I mean, I'm not opposed, you know, whatever is your thing, but I don't want, I don't want these furries that came out of nowhere running around in my world. You know, they don't have any lore behind them. They don't have any history behind them. You know, why don't you just make a separate game? that has all the players and all the all the NPCs are all furries and it's like Animal Kingdom and you can have a ball and people who like that can play that and put the Dragonborn there too get the Dragonborn out of the freaking regular game put the Dragonborn in there you can you can play be any stuffed animal that that makes you happy and we can separate that and then we'll keep the D&D more into the traditional fantasy trope I would prefer that Second thing is that there, there people are like, yo, this is so. You know, uh, people are going for the cool factor, you know. People they, they they're gonna make the dragonborn an actual dragon. They give a level dragonborn a level five jetpack. It's not even wings; they're spectral wings. So you pretty much get a little jetpack. Um, that is really bad for game mechanics, you know. I'm you know I'm, I'm sitting there trying to plant plant a pit trap or something like that, and these little dragonborns flying around my whole dungeon. I don't need that, all right? I just, I'm really not happy about that. Some of the changes in their mechanics, like DMs can no longer crit. Mo monsters can no longer crit because we got to protect the, uh, you know, we got to protect the little vulnerable level one characters. You know, that I just, that's just stupid because you're, 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 you're powering out the players, you're power creeping the players, and you're giving the DMs jack squat. You're not doing anything to make our monsters more interesting, our monsters a, a threat or challenge because players, as they level up in 5th edition, are already too powerful. And now you're making them more powerful. And you're not doing anything for the monsters. You know, monsters are boring. So that's why I'm not happy with the 1 D&D playtest. I mean, that on top of that, there's that OGL debacle. So I'm looking at the Cobalt, uh, flag black, uh, the Cobalt Press Black Flag playtest. And I want to support them and I want to use their playtest. So I'm going to introduce this playtest to see if anybody's interested. Packet 1 has very little, unfortunately. Um, doesn't have much to, to work with. Uh, I'm going to introduce it anyway, but it's it, what it does is it's just reskins uh, races and backgrounds. So instead, you know, we don't use the word, we don't, we're kind of trying to go away from using the word race because of the baggage the word has, which I'm fine with that. So instead we have, um, words here. We have a lineage and a heritage. So that's sort of like a, a race and a sub race. So if you, um, you, uh, you choose to be a dwarf, and once again, the ability scores are, are done differently. Now that you don't have automatic ability score adjustments based on your race, but you do have the, the traditional dwarf resilience, dwarf tough, toughness, 
Then you have a dwarf heritage, which is a sub race. You can be a fireforged dwarf um, or a stone for a stone dwarf, uh, which gives you a couple of skills, languages, etc. Gives you some proficiencies. Uh, same thing with elf and human, and they only have dwarf, elf, and human. They have three races. So it's not that much in terms of races, but what they do have is a level one feat. The level one feat is highly popular. Everybody wants it, and it's going to be implemented one way or another. Um, the one D&D has implemented already, and looks like Black Flag is also implementing it. Black Flag no longer calls feats feats. They call it talents, and the talents are pretty, pretty hefty. Like if you look at the... As compared to traditionally what feats were, if you look at the talent, um, they, they, they're they a big bunch of stuff. Like, for instance, combat casting. You automatically succeed on, constant, uh, on, on saves you make to maintain your concentration. That's pretty big. You know, automatic concentration success is a big deal. Uh, if the DC is lower than your spellcasting DC. Um, when a hostile creature enters a space within five feet of you and you do opportunity attack, you can use a cantrip. This is something that a lot of people want to do, and they're, they're formally introducing it. And you can use a shield or weapon you're holding as a spell casting focus as normal. You uh, use the same hands holding this focus to perform a somatic components. So this is also a rule that everybody ignores, but is actually a big rule in 5th edition. Everybody ignores it anyway, but in 5th edition, you're supposed to have a hand free to cast a spell. So if you're a cleric, and you want to go sword and board, and you have a mace, and you have a shield, and you want to cast a spell, technically you're supposed to put the shield away so you can use your hand to cast a spell if it has a somatic component, and then later on take the shield up. But the way the rules are written is that during one turn, you can either stow a weapon or take the weapon out. You can't stow the weapon, cast your spell, and then take the weapon out. So technically, your AC drops because you take the shield down. Nobody plays this. People just ignore this rule. But, you know, this is formally ignoring the rule, saying, you know what? This rule doesn't no longer applies. Um, that's pretty awesome. And then there's another feat that says hand-to-hand, -hand, um, which I think is, is pretty... It, this is a big deal because if you take this feat and you're a medium-sized creature, you deal 1d6 plus your strength on uh, fist attacks. This is a big deal for monks because monks, you know, they get a lot of attacks, but they, they're they rolling 1d4 damage. Doing 1d6 damage for a monk might kind of put the monk more towards the realm of like a, a, a damage dealer, like a DPS kind of character uh, on top of all the benefits of being a monk. Which, which I think is great because they haven't shown much love for monks in the supplemental material since the beginning of 5th edition. And giving them some... Well, this is not... It doesn't spe specify it's for monks. But, you know, I think this is a great thing for monks. So these are kind of hefty feats. You know, they, they, they got a lot of stuff in them. And you get it for free. You don't have to choose between the feat or an ability score. Uh, and you, your character starts off with these talents, which I think that's what we're really playtesting. We're not playtesting these races because they don't mean anything different. We're playtesting these these level one feats. That's all there is in the first uh, packet for playtesting. Uh, but the second packet is supposedly going to have a lot more stuff like spells and a couple of classes. So I'm going to I'm going to let the players, if they're interested, um, playtest this. They can create a character based on this. And the great thing about these uh, playtest rules is that they're 100% backwards compatible. You know, um, uh, the one D&D stuff, it's, you know, I'm not sure it's that backwards compatible. There's some changes that you make if you build a character on that that, you know, you kind of can't fit into 5th edition rules. Here, you can just, you can pick a race from here. Um, pick the classes from the standard 5th edition, it'll all work fine. So I'm hoping I'm hoping that you know we notice a difference when we play these playtest rules.